I will now start with the part of the course that is entitled Newtonian and Lagrangian Dynamics or Mechanics. Some of the material that will be taught is not new to you, but I think that a little reminder is always welcome. As you will see, some of the slides are marked for your information and will not be part of the video presentation. They go beyond the scope of this course. And in some slides, some items will be marked using a red triangle item. Again, the corresponding topics will not be covered. I will now start the course with the outline. I'll start with an introduction. And the idea is that we see what we mean by classical uh, mechanics and that we understand the difference between Newtonian and Lagrangian uh, mechanics. And then I will end with some useful things to know that we'll be using later on in the uh, course. The second section is about Newtonian mechanics. I will review Newton's laws, Newtonian reference frames, and I will start with the mechanics of a single elementary particle and then generalize to several particles and to uh, rigid bodies. This video will combine theory and application examples. We will do this using examples that are directly covered in the presentation. For example, models of a pendulum on a cart and a quadcopter. And I will be introducing other new applications using a whiteboard application. In the third section about uh, Lagrangian mechanics, I will leave aside most of the theory which is marked for your information. And I will start with the concept of the degree of freedom and generalized coordinates. And then I will present to you three formulations of Lagrange's methods and again they will be applied on examples that are covered directly in the presentations but I will be also using new example again using this whiteboard uh, application. The fourth and the fifth section will not be covered in the presentation. Section four covers the bifiler pendulum a model of the bifiler pendulum is obtained using Lagrange's method, so it's kind of an exercise if you're interested. And it is shown how a bifiler pendulum can be used to determine the moment of inertia of a rigid body, which might come in handy if you have an application where you have to determine this moment of inertia. And section 5 is a dictionary, English-French, which is meant to help you with the understanding. I will now start this uh, section on Newtonian and Lagrangian mechanics with the introduction. The references that I've used in this course are uh, given on the screen right now. Of course, it's not necessary for you to consult these, but I have to mention them out of intellectual honesty. The last of these uh, references is focused on the bifiler pendulum that is not uh, covered in this course. And in the next slide, you'll find the references that are focusing on the quadcopter model. Classical mechanics deals with the description of bodies under the influence of forces. And we're, of course, interested in the physical laws that underlie this motion. We will consider uh, rigid bodies. And these rigid bodies do not deform. There is no deformation. At the beginning of the course, we will start with elementary particles and then generalize to uh, rigid bodies. If you consider uh, idealized particles, uh, ideal elementary particles, then mass is the only thing that matters. But of course, if you consider rigid bodies, uh, rotation comes into play and the moment of inertia is also important. As you will see in the next slide, we will stick to large objects and small speeds. The earliest developments of mechanics concern Newtonian mechanics and later on in history reformulations were proposed and one such formulation that we will consider in the course is Lagrangian mechanics. As I've said, we will stick to classical mechanics. If 
the speed of the object approaches the speed of light, then you have to take into account relativity. And if the size of the object becomes too small, then you have to take into account, account quantum mechanics. Of course, this goes beyond the scope of this course. Let us consider a system with n particles, uh, n ideal particles. So you know that for each particle, well, there is no rotation, so you need three coordinates for the description of its motion. And since you have n particles, this gives you 3n coordinates, 3n variables. But in reality, you know that there are constraints between the coordinates, constraints between the variables. Uh, let us take uh, an example of that using a pendulum. Okay, so the first thing that I will draw is the reference frame. So we'll call this X and this is Y. And you also have the Z axis. Okay. And I'll draw the pendulum. We'll assume it's an ideal mass. And the pendulum length is L. And the angle that the pendulum is making with respect to this axis here, we'll call it theta. So if we take the variables x, y, z for the ideal mass, of course we know that there are constraints. Very often the pendulum will be restricted to move in a plane, and so we'll say that z equals zero, and there are constraints between x and y. They are constrained by the equations that you see uh, on the screen. So things are much simpler in reality, and you feel that well, instead of using x, y, and z, you should use uh, theta. As you will see, if you work with Newtonian mechanics, often this leads to problems where we will be using the sum of forces, the sum of moments along the traditional coordinates, x, y, z, and this leads to a lot of equations, typically 3n equations and 3 equations per uh, particle, and these equations then have to be uh, simplified, taking into account the uh, constraints. As I've said in the example of the pendulum, we see that x and y are linked through theta, and we'll see later in the course that theta is what is called a generalized coordinate. It is linked to the single degree of freedom, the rotation of the pendulum. Lagrangian uh, mechanics will allow us to obtain the equation of motion directly in terms of the generalized coordinates without going through a step of simplification. Yeah? We will see that this method is linked to the notion of energy, kinetic, kinetic energy and potential energy. I will now introduce you to the main contributors uh, to the course. Uh, first, Isaac uh, Newton, famous for sitting under a tree and have an apple fall uh, on his face is the star of uh, section two about uh, newtonian mechanics then you have jean d'alembert famous for the d'alembert principle uh, he is mentioned in section uh, three and then someone that you already know from the course on digital control leonard euler but he's also famous uh, for the Euler law of motion and famous for the Euler angles that describe the attitude of a rigid body and you'll meet him at the end of uh, section 2 and then another person that you already know from the optimization course uh, Joseph Lagrange is the star of uh, section 3 about Lagrangian uh, mechanics I will now show you some stuff that I will be using later on in the course. And the first thing is the triple vector product. It's uh, defined as the cross product of one vector with the cross product of two other uh, vectors. And of course, the result should be also a vector. Okay, so we have here the cross vector of two vectors. So that's a vector. And if you take the 
cross product of one vector with this vector here of course this should be also a vector you see that this is the scalar product so this is a scalar and this is also a scalar okay so scalar times vector is a vector scalar times vector is a vector the difference between two vectors is a vector okay i'm not going to go further than that i'm not going to prove this but you can see that this relation makes some kind of sense and it will be used later on in the course in this slide we consider two successive infinitesimal rotations infinitesimal another word for small so the first uh, rotation is around the axis delta theta one okay so you do a small rotation around this axis starting from the vector r this is a small angle delta theta one and this produces the vector r prime r prime can be seen as the vector the original vector r plus some other vector that you see here shown and this delta r1 can be written as a cross product okay so this cross product is dr1 and the cross product is the cross product of this vector here delta theta 1 with the vector r a cross product is giving a vector in the perpendicular direction and so it will be something like that and if you turn the vector from here to the vector r it will the vector the resulting vector will be pointing that way so this is exactly what we see over here and this is how dr1 is obtained so this is the first infinitesimal rotation we have a second one it's exactly the same idea but we start from the vector r prime right and we turn around the vector delta theta 2 with a small angle delta theta 2 okay so we produce r double prime and again r double prime can be written as r prime plus some vector dr2 dr2 again can be seen as a cross product yeah the cross product of delta theta 2 with the vector r prime okay so we have our two small uh, rotations and what we can do now is write this one not as a function of r prime but as a function of the original vector r this means that we have to inject this equation because this is r prime into this equation over here so we need to inject it twice and this is the equation that we obtain if we expand that we arrive at this equation which has three terms and the last term involves only very small quantities and it can be neglected if the rotations are very small are infinitesimal so we arrive at our result yeah. we see that the vector r double prime can be obtained from the original vector r through a rotation around the vector here in green and this vector in green is the vector sum of the original vector delta theta 1 and the vector delta theta 2. So the conclusion is that infinitesimal rotations add up as vectors.